There's the Countess of Ross. Mm. And, um, that's John Jacob Astor, the richest man on the ship. Uh huh. His little wifey there, Madeline, is my age and in a delicate condition. We, we know, Rose. See how she's trying to hide it? Quite the scandal. You already told us that. And that's Benjamin Guggenheim and his mistress, Madame Aubert. Oh. Mrs. Guggenheim is at home with the children, of course. Okay. Well, let's talk about it. In the immediate days after the Titanic sank, there was a frenzy amongst the relatives of its passengers to get information on their loved ones, hoping that the ones they knew beat the odds and were among the survivors. Incorrect headlines had been printed, reflecting that people who had in fact died were alive. People like John Jacob Astor and Isidore and Ida Strauss. There was even uncertainty about who had even boarded the ship to begin with, as can be seen in this notice that was printed in the Buffalo News on April 16, 1912, that shows that Benjamin Guggenheim's brother had some questions of his own. Quote, Senator Guggenheim of Colorado, in telephone consultation with the White Star Line officials in New York today, was unable to learn of the fate of his brother, Benjamin Guggenheim, reputed one of the wealthiest men in the world. So far as known, his wife did not accompany him. Well, his wife certainly did not accompany him. That might have made the trip rather odd for his mistress. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these stories about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Miss history a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream. And hit that like button to support this video. Thank you. Now, on to why you are here. For a lot of us, when we hear the name Guggenheim, the first thing that comes to mind is the Guggenheim. Maybe we don't think of its full name, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum. But today's subject, Benjamin Guggenheim, is part of that Guggenheim family. Like a number of the men who traveled in first class on the RMS Titanic in April of 1912, he was one of the wealthiest in the world. He, like his brothers, made his fortune on the coattails and name of his father, Mayor Guggenheim. He started out in the importing business in the 1840s and eventually made his huge fortune in the mining and smelting industries, leaving generational wealth for his 10 children who he had with his wife, Barbara seven boys and three girls. Most of his sons went into the family business. The Guggenheim is the namesake of one of those sons, Solomon. Benjamin Guggenheim was an industry captain of mining and smelting and helped to expand the family business into Europe. He married his wife in 1894. They had three daughters together. Yet he had a reputation for being a playboy around New York City. Now, I have long heard this narrative that Benjamin Guggenheim went down on the Titanic in true Playboy fashion, dressed in his best, saying that he was prepared to go down like a gentleman. But I never really understood exactly why people said that about him, that he had a reputation for being a Playboy. Yes, he was traveling on the Titanic with his French mistress, but that could have been a very unlucky and isolated incident. But after searching through five years worth of newspapers, I finally saw that it wasn't an isolated incident, and that Benjamin Guggenheim had a cheating scandal that made it to the papers in 1907. It is very evident from newspaper articles and stories that Benjamin Guggenheim and his wife lived very separate lives. He was always in Europe for weeks and even months at a time. In fact, most of the times he was written about it was regarding his departure from or returning to America, and his wife often attended parties solo or through her own parties without him present. Benjamin Guggenheim being caught out on sea with a mistress was likely a big surprise to no one, because five years before the Titanic sank, he was named as a co-respondent in a divorce suit that another man, Samuel Tuska, brought against his wife, Amy Goldsmith Tuska, when he caught her in the act, in his apartment, with Benjamin Guggenheim. While most headlines about the Guggenheim-Tuska affair put it as gently as they could, the Morning Post on April 30, 1907, 
took another approach and spelled it out quite clearly in the biggest font offered at the time. Their headline read, Rich Man in Her Bedroom, Brother of United States Senator Guggenheim Implicated in a Divorce Suit, Husband Broke in Door to Get Evidence. Well, so here's what the story says. Of course, when you're from a family as rich and powerful and famous as the Guggenheims, when you have a tiny little slip up and happen to find yourself in the bed of a woman who is someone else's wife, the media is going to pull your whole family into the situation. So this article actually starts off talking about Benjamin Guggenheim's brother, Senator Simon Guggenheim, as if the readers would have confused Benjamin with some other guy named Benjamin Guggenheim. Anyway, it's the husband who filed for divorce, a man named Samuel Tuska. He was also a rich businessman. Not Guggenheim rich, but he held the positions of treasurer, director, and president of multiple companies, rich enough to move in the same circles as the Guggenheims. His wife was Amy Goldsmith Tuska, and he had been granted an absolute divorce from her. The couple had a son, a six-year-old named Robert, and Samuel was awarded full custody of him. According to the terms of the decree, Mrs. Tuska would have to apply at some later date for what we would now call visitation. But at the time the divorce was granted, she did not have the, quote, privilege of seeing the lad. And she lost another privilege in the divorce, one that she would not be able to regain at a later date. For, also according to the decree, she was not permitted to marry ever again. Well, that should have taught her to not mess over Samuel Tuska. All the parties involved, the Tuskas, the Goldsmiths, and especially Benjamin Guggenheim, did all that they could to keep this story private. And for good reason. Each of their families was a part of high society, and this story would be a bad look for each party in a different way. The Goldsmiths didn't want their daughter and sister to be seen as a trollop, I'm sure that Amy herself didn't want that either. Mr. Tuska certainly would not have wanted his own manhood called into question, but how could anyone think anything differently with another man coming into his home to serve as his wife? And the prominent and upright business leader, husband, and father, Benjamin Guggenheim, certainly didn't need for the world to know that he was an adulterer. Each family separately had enough money, power, and influence to keep the story concealed for some time. So the combined power of all three families kept the story out of the news until the court was finished with the case. And even then, the judge ordered that the papers in the case were to be sealed. Even though all of the murky details never made it to the press, it was made very clear that the nail in the coffin of the Tuska marriage was Benjamin Guggenheim being caught not only inside of Amy Tuska's bedroom, but inside of Amy Tuska. Quote, it was learned, however, that the divorce had been obtained on testimony that showed that Benjamin Guggenheim had been surprised under embarrassing circumstances in the apartment of Mrs. Tuska, end quote. And even though the Morning Post headline implies that it was Amy's husband who found her in bed with Benjamin, it's made clear from multiple reports that there were in fact two men hired by Samuel Tuska who broke into the apartment to catch the two in the throes of passion. Samuel must have had his suspicions. Every bit of the story is written in a flashback style because no one outside of the involved parties knew anything. So, right after the affair was discovered, the Tuskas separated. They had lived separately for over a year leading up to the trial, and only a handful of their closest friends even knew that. And the ones who knew that they were separated didn't know why. Nobody had a clue that Benjamin Guggenheim had been sleeping with Amy. And just like that, Amy lost her husband, her son, and her close friend, Florette. Who was Florette? I'm glad you asked. Florette Seligman. Florette Seligman, Guggenheim. Benjamin's wife. Yeah, she was sleeping with her close friend's husband. So you can imagine that it was a shock to everyone who saw the story in the papers, because by that time, everything was settled. 
Had this story played out in the public eye in real time, there would have been hundreds, maybe even thousands, of news articles about it. But Samuel Tuska moved in silence. As soon as the word got back to him that Benjamin was having sex with his wife, he hired a divorce attorney, a family member named Benjamin also, Benjamin Tuska. And they got the ball rolling on the divorce immediately. After Amy was served divorce papers, she hired an attorney and denied the claims. But since she was caught getting Guggenheimed, nobody believed her, and the divorce went through per her husband's wishes. Even though she claimed her innocence and didn't want the divorce, she went out as gracefully as she could have, considering the circumstances. She didn't ask for alimony, which is good because Samuel certainly wasn't going to give her any. But it's not like she lived out the remainder of her life in poverty. She came from a wealthy family, too, and was an heiress in her own right, thanks to her father's fortune. Benjamin Guggenheim sent in a written denial to the court via his attorney. His friends were surprised and upset with him because they thought that if the allegations weren't true, then he should have gone further to protect his own image and Amy's also. They thought that if he really wanted to set the record straight, he would have gone before the court to give oral testimony. Perhaps he was too tired from already having given oral... Never mind. The judge, who was called a referee in this ruling, could only disclose to the media that the testimony of the two men who walked in on Benjamin and Amy was, quote, sensational in character. Now, at the time the news broke, all of the involved parties knew that the year-old story was finally going to become public. So... Most likely in an effort to ride out the storm with as little embarrassment as possible, Amy Goldsmith Tuska went away to Paris in early April of 1907, three weeks prior to the public announcement. Guess who else was in Paris when the story broke? Benjamin Guggenheim. But don't worry, he probably wasn't stuffing his sausage into Amy's croissant. He took his wife and kids with him. And oh yeah... His wife had no idea about any part of this story. I guess that Benjamin thought that his wife might take the news better while taking a stroll down the Champs-Élysées. Remember, this story broke on the last day of April. Guggenheim's lawyer told the papers that Benjamin wasn't feeling well, but would be back to visit New York City for business in June. No doubt, bringing his whole family back with him from Paris. Then after that, according to attorney Levenrit, because Benjamin had not been feeling well for the last eight months, perhaps his stomach was feeling a little queasy from his worries about this story breaking, but anyway, because Benjamin had not been feeling well for the last eight months, he would live abroad for most of the time the next year. That is almost a verbatim quote from his attorney. Reading between the lines, it sounds like Benji Boy was leaving his wife at home to deal with the shame of his affair that became public while he went back to Europe and did whatever he wanted to do. Or whomever he wanted to do. And with that said, I think that we now know one of the reasons why Benjamin Guggenheim had a reputation for being a playboy. He earned it fairly and on his last transatlantic trip on the Titanic in April of 1912, Benjamin was returning home to his wife and children with his Parisian mistress on board with him. Now, let's fast forward five years to April of 1912. That puts Benjamin Guggenheim on the RMS Titanic after one of his many extended trips to France. Perhaps he brought back some Eiffel Tower snowballs for his daughters and held them in safe keeping in his luxury cabin. But without a doubt, the biggest souvenir that he was bringing home from Paris was for himself. It was his mistress. When the Titanic made its maiden and final voyage not quite across the Atlantic Ocean in April of 1912, she was carrying some of the richest people on the planet. American businessman Benjamin Guggenheim was in that number. He had made this trip back and forth from New York to Paris several times in order to conduct business for the family empire. And as far as his wife knew, 
or at least as far as she cared to put on for the public, all of the European trips that he took without her were business trips. But Benjamin was known to mix business with pleasure. He had highly profitable business operations in Europe, so he would often make a lot of transatlantic trips. But beyond offering a destination to handle his business, Europe, and France in particular, was a place where he could cheat on his wife in peace and not have to worry about those nosy American news reporters. For there was certainly evidence on record that he didn't mind cheating on his wife. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence of a divorce suit filed by Mrs. Guggenheim to get rid of her cheating husband. By this time, his wife knew. Heck, everybody knew but she seemed to be content to turn a blind eye to his cheating. Shut her mouth and endure, because that was her price to pay for the privilege of being able to call herself Mrs. Guggenheim. All of this to say that it's absolutely no surprise that Benjamin would have been coming home to New York from Paris with a mistress in tow, flaunting her on the ship in front of all of those friends that he and his wife shared in common. Oddly enough, Guggenheim had been in perilous conditions on sea two years before the Titanic sank with one of the Titanic's most controversial survivors, J. Bruce Ismay. He was the agent of the White Star Line, the man who was famously portrayed in James Cameron's Titanic film as the man who pushed the captain to speed across the Atlantic in order to make record time and to make headlines and as the coward who got into a lifeboat along with women and children instead of dying an honorable death along with the other gentlemen. Well, in 1910, Ismay and Guggenheim were on the Mauritania, which was also referenced in the Titanic movie, and the two men happened to be aboard the Mauritania during a storm that caused the captain to have to cut down her speed. On that voyage, Benjamin Guggenheim was returning home from Paris after having established a factory there for his business, the International Steam Pump Company, to perform work for the French government. And it is highly likely that it was on a business trip like this one that he would have met his mistress who left Paris with him to travel to New York aboard the Titanic. Her name was Leontine Aubin. Leontine was born in Paris in 1887. She was 24 years old when she boarded the Titanic on April 10, 1912, at Cherbourg, France. Benjamin, by the way, was 47. Leontine went by the name Ninette. She was a nightclub singer. Benjamin paid for her ticket and also the ticket of her maid, Emma, and his valet, Victor. For the first few days, it was nothing but partying it up on the grandest vessel to ever hit the waters with Benjamin acting like he didn't have a wife in New York City, dining and dancing with Ninette and having a blast while his wife was at home, being a mother to their daughters. But trouble came at 11.40 p.m. on April 14th, when Titanic hit the iceberg. After the collision, Leontine and her maid Emma went to see what it caused it. They went to inform Benjamin and his valet telling them that the ship had struck an iceberg, to which Victor replied, Never mind icebergs. What is an iceberg? Then, like many of their fellow passengers, Leontine and Emma grew unconcerned after learning about the collision because they knew that their ship was unsinkable. So Leontine returned to cabin B-35, her luxury stateroom, to go back to bed. But not long after she would have to get up again, along with her maid, and they would not be returning to their cabins. They left their rooms in order to get up on deck and into a lifeboat, for the unsinkable ship was in fact sinking. Benjamin and his valet saw to it that Leontine and her maid both escaped the disaster, helping them get into lifeboat number nine. Translated from French to English, this is how Leontine described it. Quote, we were in our night clothes. Life belts were put around us. On the deck, there was no commotion. Every one of them, a perfect gentleman. 
calmly puffing cigarettes and cigars and watching the women and children being placed in the boats. Emma got into the lifeboat, and then I. We were the last women to leave the ship. Those Englishmen, still with cigarettes in mouth, facing the death so bravely that it was all the more terrible. End quote. From the safety of lifeboat number nine, both Leontine and Emma would endure the freezing cold of the wee hours of the morning, then be rescued by the Carpathia. As for Benjamin and his valet, Victor, there would be no lifeboat, no rescue ship. After Benjamin went to wake up his mistress to tell her to get on deck because the ship was sinking, he reportedly gave this message to a steward. If anything should happen to me, tell my wife I've done my best in doing my duty. There don't seem to be any reports of Benjamin Guggenheim trying to save himself. He and Victor changed into their finest evening clothes and waited to die. And after both men helped many women and children get into lifeboats, Titanic survivor Rose Ickard said that she saw Benjamin put a rose in his buttonhole and she heard him say, We've dressed up in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. And that's what happened. Both men went down with Titanic, and neither body was ever recovered. That was the end of his life, but that would not be the end of Guggenheim's scandals. Meanwhile on the Carpathia, Leontine was able to send a Marconogram to let her loved ones in Paris know that she had survived. And after that, she pretty much had a mental breakdown. All that she could have known was that whatever plans she had made with Benjamin were as dead as he was. He was her meal ticket in every sense of the word. And because she didn't speak English, he was her connection to the world that he was bringing her to. Needless to say, things didn't work out as they had planned. And I must say that I wonder what their plan was exactly. Benjamin was bringing Nanette to his hometown. Was she to live in his house with his family, and his wife was just going to tolerate his having a mistress? Was he going to bring her to live with his family under the guise of her being a new house servant? Then he could sneak off to her quarters in the middle of the night for sex? Was he going to put her up in an apartment close enough to his home and just go visit her every chance that he got? I really wonder what their plan was. I wonder all the more after finding this newspaper quote about her, which was almost impossible to find. Her name was Leontine, but she was often called Ninette by close relations. Her last name was Aubart, A-U-B-A-R-T, but it was often misspelled as Aubert, A-U-B-E-R-T, which apparently is a more common French last name, and that's something that I did not know, but I learned thanks to Grace from the Grace Report channel on YouTube, who lives in Paris and helped me out with these names. So this is the only quote that I ever found regarding her condition, and that was after searching for the wrong name. On April 20th, 1912, the New York Star Eagle printed a long story about how Titanic survivors were faring only days after the disaster. Quote, One French woman in particular, Mrs. Ninette Aubert of Paris, was nearly insane with grief. Her husband has been lost. End quote. Her husband. This had to have gotten back to Mrs. Guggenheim, but clearly, None of the writers of that day were able to put together that she had been traveling with one of the most famous men whose name was often in big, bold letters in their other Titanic stories, and that the husband who Ninette was speaking of was none other than the already married Benjamin Guggenheim. I guess that the entire passenger list was taking the what happens on Titanic stays on Titanic approach as far as the press was concerned. After arriving in New York and receiving basic medical treatment, 
Leontine was able to return to France in early May of 1912, thanks to the White Star Line for making travel arrangements possible for her and her maid to return to Europe on their ship called the Adriatic. This was roughly three weeks after the sinking, and her nerves were still understandably such a wreck that when she boarded the Adriatic, Leontine had forgotten to bring her steamer, which likely would have been the largest piece of luggage she had. She also left her train tickets that she needed for the final leg of her trip. But eventually, she and Emma made it back home to Paris. And after she had a while to take a deep breath and collect her thoughts, she did what many Titanic survivors eventually got around to doing, and that was suing White Star Line. She was recovering from losing everything. Most of what she owned was what Benjamin had purchased for her, and it all went down with the ship. So when it came time to list all that she needed to be compensated for, she got very detailed. Leontine wanted to be paid for getting sick and suffering permanent injuries from having been subjected to the cold air when she was on the lifeboat. After all, she was rather scantily clad because she had been dressed for bed. She claimed to have been sick, sore, and lame. She also wanted compensation for mental pain, anguish, distress, and impaired senses and faculties. She said that her health and constitution were shattered and her nervous system had been permanently affected. And then, of course, she placed a claim for her lost belongings. I had many trunks of hats and dresses. Nothing could be taken with me. She also had 4,000 pounds worth of jewels in her cap and that Benjamin Guggenheim had purchased for her. And of course, she included that in her suit as well. That's quite an expensive lot of jewelry, especially for a mistress. Now, why was that 4,000 pounds worth of jewels so important? It shouldn't have been, at least not to a millionaire. And that's what Benjamin Guggenheim was, right? A millionaire? That's what all the newspapers said. That's how he lived his life. Well, when his wife, Florette, and their daughters got what was left of his money, she said that she felt like a poor relation. Why was that? After the affair that made the news in 1907, and also after openly flaunting his mistress on the Titanic, Benjamin would embarrass his wife one more time, after his death. When it came to his will. But let's get back to the mistress. Leontine, along with many other Titanic survivors, tried to recoup all that they could. Collectively, they wanted to get about $6 million from the luxury ship company. As we all know, Leontine was on the ship with someone else's husband, who she claimed to be her husband. In your opinion, did she deserve to get anything back from White Star Line? I wonder if she ever told them who her quote-unquote husband was. Nothing in print from 1912 ties them together. I did happen to find a passenger list that shows their names on the same page, but nowhere close to each other. But because of how public and open Benjamin was with their relationship, everything in me believes that the news of Leontine got back to Mrs. Guggenheim. And frankly, I believe that the secrecy that the Guggenheims wanted to keep about his cheating with Mrs. Tusca in 1907, they were successful in obtaining when it came to his titanic mistress, Leontine. Because there was virtually no mention of her in New York publications after the sinking. But, thanks to Encyclopedia Titanica, there is a little information about Leontine, a.k.a. Ninette, after she got home to Paris. Very little information, in fact. There are her Marconogram telegrams, which were in French, but thankfully translated to English. The one that actually was transmitted simply said, I'm saved but Ben is lost. The one that didn't go through was meant to let family and friends back home know that she and Emma had both been saved. Beyond that, 
It is written that Leontine threw some wild parties in the 1920s that got so out of hand that police officers often had to show up to shut them down. She died on October 29, 1964, just months after her maid, at the age of 77. As for Benjamin, I believe that death on the Titanic was probably easier for him to face than facing his financial reality in front of his wife back home. On May 8, 1912, about two months after his death, the Wall Street Journal had estimated his estate to be worth somewhere between $5 million to $10 million. Then, in December of the following year, 1913, the Wall Street Journal confirmed that, in fact, at the time of Benjamin Guggenheim's death, he owned little more than stock in the International Steam Pump Company. Here's how the Sunday people summed it up. Quote, Mrs. Guggenheim was to discover her husband had squandered $8 million on bad investments. She said she felt like a poor relation when he left his three children half a million dollars. End quote. Well, that is a lot of money missing from what she expected. But that made the remaining Guggenheims broke. But rich people broke, not poor people broke. Adjusted for inflation, that half a million in 1913 is worth a little more than $15 million today in 2023. But it's still a far cry from the 5 to $10 million that all the papers reported was his estimated net worth. The $8 million his wife was sure that she and her daughters would get. Oddly enough, when another death hit the family in 1913, this time on Florette Guggenheim's side of the family, the Seligman side, it might have seemed like another opportunity for her to get her hands on some of the family fortune, but it didn't turn out that way for her after her brother, Washington Seligman, committed suicide. Much like her own husband, Florette's brother's fortune was significantly less than what everyone thought it was. His $1 million net worth was reduced to a mere $138,000 after his debts were paid. And 50000 of that was to go to a quote-unquote friend of his named Anita Sutherland before anyone else got anything. And with only $88,000 left to go around, Florette Guggenheim wouldn't have been able to get much of her brother's money anyway. But the truth was that even if his $1 million had been available at the time of his death and intact, Mrs. Guggenheim wouldn't have gotten any of it anyway. He had left his sister out of his will. Not due to bad blood or anything like that. His thought was that she had married well and would not need any money. He had the same clause in place for one of his brothers, Jefferson. His will reading, quote, not because I entertain less affection toward either of them than toward any of my other brothers and sisters, but because their circumstances in life are more fortunate than those of my other brothers and sisters. End quote. It was an understandable assumption on her brother's part. The Guggenheim name was synonymous with wealth. Benjamin Guggenheim died relatively broke, but in his lifetime he did earn millions of dollars. And a huge factor in his being able to do so was the head start that he was given by his father when his father left Benjamin and his siblings very healthy sums of money after his death. And that's something that Benjamin wasn't able to do on the same scale for his own children. It can often be sad or funny in an ironic way to look at how a thing begins versus how it ends. I stumbled upon a story about the wedding of Benjamin Guggenheim and Florette Seligman. The story was printed on the day after their October 24th wedding in 1894. It sounded like it must have been a beautiful occasion held at Delmonico's, which is arguably the genesis for fine dining in America. There were exotic, expensive flowers all over the restaurant, inside and outside, and even on Florette's dress. Florette gave her bridesmaids diamond pins for their gifts. But Florette was the recipient of diamonds and other jewels on that day, too. Quote, 
The many gifts received by the bride included several checks, each representing a good-sized fortune. Rarely have such handsome jewels of all kinds and in every conceivable setting been received as gifts by one person. End quote. I would like to think that Florette, like many brides, cherished and kept a lot of her wedding presents, and therefore maybe, just maybe, she kept all of those jewels that were gifted to her. So in the end, there is poetic justice for the wife and not the mistress whose jewels were lost at sea with the man she cheated with. Do you know who else died without leaving his kids a lot of money? Johnny Taylor. But he didn't even claim all of his children. I published a video about that story that you can see here. I'll leave a link to it in the description box. My sources for this story are The Evening World News Archives, 1907 The Morning Post Archives, 1907 The Chattanooga Star Archives, 1907 The New York Tribune Archives, 1910 The Buffalo News Archives, 1912 New York Star Eagle Archives, 1912 the Wall Street Journal Archives, 1912 and 1913. The Sun Archives, 1913. The Sunday People Archives, 1998. The New York Times Archives, 1894. Jenny.com. Encyclopedia Titanica. And a very special thanks to Grace from the Grace Report channel on YouTube for help with French name pronunciation. She speaks French fluently, so if you don't like my butchering of the language and you want to hear someone speak French perfectly, you can go to her channel and hear her speak French sometimes, but if you want to hear entertainment reporting, that is her forte. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon, Ty's Too Hot Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the Hot Hot Mess History. The link is in the description box.